what do you believe right now that's making you feel this way? And when you analyse it, you realise how irrational you can be at times. Every single one of our major customers and minor customers all shut their doors overnight. It's not sales per se, but the outcome of it is because people get to know you, they get to see you. Making those efficiencies to maximise service profits as well as just product profits. When you lose the enthusiasm, that's the point to move on. Scaling up a business isn't easy. If it were, we wouldn't have less than 4% of businesses scaling beyond 10 employees or around a million pound turnover level and less than 1% beyond 50 employees. But the contribution that we make as owner managers to our economies is immense and should never be underestimated. Yet it can be a tough gig for all of us at times. And only other business owners truly understand the challenges that we face. And through Scale Up Radio, we aim to help make things a little easier. We interview guests who have been where you are now and may have faced some of the challenges that you are facing. And they offer their thoughts and advice on what has worked for them as well as what didn't. And we've also combined many of the lessons from these interviews and also through working with hundreds of owner managers over the last 10 years or so into a practical scale-up handbook that we've called the Entrepreneurial Scale-Up System, or ESIS. And it's for owner managers like you and me as we navigate our own scale-up journey. And you can order a copy through your favorite online book retailer or by going to all the W's, esisgroup.co.uk www.esusgroup.co.uk Well, I'm still grinning after this interview today with Jim Holland, who is the co-founder of Karma. It was a really great conversation. And, and Jim co-founded setting up a company called Karma, which is essentially a digital platform that focuses on social and environmental impact by employing veterans and service leavers in something called the Green Task Force to plant trees. So they're making a really positive impact in the world. And uh, it's a, it really was a fantastic discussion and a great journey that Jim has been on. We talk about starting off in Barnsley and uh, joining the Royal Navy and all that happened in between. And it really is a fascinating conversation and one that I am certain will put a smile on your face. So I'm going to leave it there and suggest that you listen to Jim and his story. Welcome to another episode of Scale Up Radio. I'm here today with, with Jim, uh, Jim Holland of Karma. So Jim, welcome to Scale Up Radio. Thank you, Kevin. Absolutely delighted to be here with you this evening. <laughs> yeah, and you, wait, I'm keeping you away from the gym, although I know you said you've, you've been to the gym at lunchtime today, so you're all right. Yeah, I, I thought just in case we went on a little bit too long, that I'd, I'd get it out of the way. So yeah, I've been, I'm pumped and I'm ready for this interview. Fantastic. And uh, I, I, those listening, we haven't got the video, but Jim's got a big grin on his face. So I'm a bit worried what I'm going to face here. I think we've got, a, got, get, got potential for a bit of, bit of cheat going on here, but we'll see. We'll see how we go. <laughs> all right, Jim. So what is karma all about? Well, karma, yeah. It's, it's, it, karma is the most wonderful thing I've ever been involved with Kevin and, and we, we say our our North Star is social and environmental impact. Karma is a digital platform that makes social and environmental impact simple and affordable and that's for both businesses and consumers and we do that by planting trees. We plant trees in the UK, employ veterans and service leavers in the Green Task Force and the Green Task Force provides these veterans and service leavers with positive pathways to employment through nature-based tasks. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll dig deeper into this, but when I heard about what the Green Task Force was doing, this is what set me off on the path to forming Karma. We also plant trees overseas. We are um, employing some of the most impoverished communities on the globe. And we're just out to make a difference. We've got some wonderful, big, audacious goals that we're gonna hit. We, we want to remove 1 billion tons of CO2 from the atmosphere. Okay. Our tree planting exploits, and, and we want to do that as fast as we can, so we can get onto the next billion tons. And what, and what, and what got you? What got you into this? You were, you were military, I believe, before that. You're a veteran. Yes, yeah, so, so 
Uh, I live in, in Newbury in West Berkshire, but you might have picked up already that, that I'm not from around these parts. I'm, uh, I was born in South Yorkshire in a, in a, a former mining town called Barnsley. Right. And the best decision I ever made was to leave Barnsley when I was 17. I joined, <laughs> I joined, I joined the Royal Navy. And uh, what, what a wonderful thing. I had 13 wonderful years, really bettering myself. I left Barnsley with three very, very poor GCSEs uh, back in the day. I, I left the Royal Navy 13 years later with a HND in electronic engineering and a degree in computing. Unfortunately, my, my Royal Naval career was cut short through a rugby league injury. Oh, right. And uh, at, at this point, when I was medically discharged from the Navy, I made my biggest mistake. And that biggest mistake was going back to Barnsley. <laughs> and, uh, I had moved on significantly, a, a host of qualifications that I've already mentioned, a wealth of world experience that you certainly don't get in Barnsley, uh, management experience, people experience, and then the biggest mistake, I went back to Barnsley and it hadn't moved on one jot, Kevin. I was bitterly disappointed. <laughs> and I, and I yeah. went back to, to the town I'd left with zero opportunities. And I expected the world to be at my feet. And it, it's a bit of a shock because overnight, I, I, I'd lost three things leaving the military. My foster's family, my purpose and my identity. And yeah. I really struggled to resettle. And I mean, really struggled. I'd, I had a big pot of money that I'd sold my house on the south coast. I bought a very nice house up in Barnsley and, and I, I started my own business. I bought a town centre pub. Oh, wow. Thought, yeah, this is it. It was a great going concern. It was you know, 2001, the economy was booming and the pub was booming. And uh, I very, very quickly um, learned a harsh lesson in economics. Right. <clears throat> when they say, um, Turnover is va vanity and profit is sanity. We could yeah. directly apply it to this, this business I okay. bought. I turned over a million pound in the first year and, and made less less than 30,000. Um, in the second year, I, I was hemorrhaging money and uh, I lost the business for a, uh, I sold the business for a substantial loss back in 2004 and then really struggled to find employment. I was fortunate. Because <laughs> I, I, I had a great network, and uh, my, my network included a lot of ex-military, a lot of ex-navy, and one of my friends, he worked at Vodafone, he rang me up, and at the time I was doing some roofing, of all things. Okay. A guy with a degree in computing, H and in electronic engineering, <clears throat> being a labourer for a, a roofing gang. And and yeah. some kind of some kind of injury that that invalided you out of the of the navy, but you could still climb up onto roofs. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. In a controlled environment, I'm not so bad, which is why if I train and really take care of how, how I move, I, I, I'm well. It's but if I'm working on my haunches or really low down, I'm all right with heights. Right. I'm just <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, I was in the back of a van and just try, trying to earn a few quid. And one of my friends rang me up and said, how are you getting on, Jim? I said, Steve, I'll be honest with you. I'm really struggling. I'm about to lose my house. My mental health's not good. I'm doing roof. And he went, roof? And he said, with your qualifications, he said, wow. He said, look, my boss, he said, there's a place in my team. We're a team of Unix engineers. My boss is employing. He, 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 he's not been able to fill it. Send me your CV. I'll get him to give you a ring. So I got home and I sent in my CV. It's about three o'clock in the afternoon now because roof has finished early so they can have a crafty pint. Yeah, and, uh, and, you, st and you start early, of course. Don't you? <clears throat> of course, yes. It's a seven o'clock start. So, so it's a full working day. Yeah. And <laughs> so I sent in my CV and uh, he said, oh, it's brilliant. I've got it. I'll send it on to a guy called Mike. I said, so what, what's the job, Steve? He said, well, it's a Unix engineer. So he said, you might want to look it up. I said, okay. So... I did a little bit of Googling. Ten minutes later, I got a phone call. <laughs> <laughs> hi, hi, Jim, it's Michael O'Connor. I'm ringing you from Vodafone. Uh, I've heard you're looking for a job. I've got your CV. I can see you've got a degree in computing. Um, look, really impressive stuff. Um, what do you know about Unix? I said, well, I'm not going to lie to you, Mike. I've just Googled it. There's 48 commands. How difficult can it be? <laughs> and he just, like you do now, he just bust out laughing. He went, that's brilliant. He said, can you come down and have an interview? 
<laughs> yeah, of course. So, so <clears throat> on the Friday, I went down, drove down. My auntie drove me down to to, to Newbury, and, and I had this four hour interview with this guy, brilliant guy, and, and it gave it just gave me a, a leg up. And really, I was in his team for eighteen months, and when I left his team for an internal move within Vodafone, eighteen months later. I still didn't know a right lot about Unix, <laughs> <laughs> but I got stuff. I got stuff done, and what one of my core strengths is just getting things done within an organisation, working collaboratively across departments. And yeah, I, I stood out a little bit at Vodafone. I had eight wonderful years there, and, and and rather than sending emails, I used to go talk to people, and that was quite early in there. But it worked, and, and we got stuff done. And but when I left, I was running the entire B two C operation from an operational perspective and okay. uh, fulfillment making sure everyone got hold of the mobile phones and more importantly that we connected the mobile phones to the network because if you don't connect the phone to the network guess what you don't charge your customers so back in the day if you got an iphone and you weren't connected you got a free iphone <laughs> we, soon, we, we, we soon put paid to that and it was wonderful met my wife there sally we've now got four kids so Vodafone and Steve McCann, who, who got me the job, have got a lot to answer for. Yeah, it was brilliant. It was it was it was everything the Navy was—a large organisation, clear clear mission, clear clear vision, clear values—and I just fitted in, and it, it was like picking up where the Navy had left off. And it for me, that was my resettlement, Kevin. Brilliant. Lovely. So what Lovely. what led to what led to you leaving? I got offered. The, the job and I can't say I'm grinning now when I think about the title and uh, I got offered a job at, at Sky and a friend of mine had left Vodafone he'd gone to Sky said it's a brilliant job for you here I said look best will in the world Gary I, I can't work for you I've done that once and he went it's not actually working for me it's working for a guy called Keith so well what, what what's the role and he said it's head of quality and compliance I know, well, there's, there's two words that you wouldn't necessarily associate with me. And he, he, he was laughing. I went, tell you what, I'll come up and have an interview. And I'll never forget it. I drove up the M4, went to Sky, met this wonderful guy called Keith and, and um, the lady who was going on maternity leave. I had this interview, which I'd done zero prep for. And he was asking me some fairly fundamental questions that if I'd have done a little bit of research into Sky, I'd have known the answer for and uh, I was driving down the M4, feeling a little bit crestfallen. And, and the recruiter rang me, a guy called Lewis. He said, hi, James, Lewis. He said, how do you think the interview went? I said, you know what? I said, I've really let three people down. I said, I've let myself down. I've let you down. I've let, let Keith down. Because I went up, I didn't really prep for it. Didn't think I'd want the role. But I've met Keith. And, you know, there's, there's something about the guy. I really like him. And I, I, I could see myself working for him. So I've only met him for an hour, but I've got a lot of respect for him. He said, it must be a lucky day, Jim. So because he feels the same. Now, can you can you do some prep? And can you come back and have an interview next week? And I went, <laughs> tell you what, you're on. And uh, <laughs> I went back next week. I put a lot of effort into it. And, and, and but yeah, I, I cut long story short. I got the job at Sky. I, I, I was a head of quality and compliance for a year. It was a maternity cover, but it was... It was it was a really, it was a big role um, in a big organisation, and it, it came at the right time. Sally was pregnant with daughter number three. I've got four daughters. Wow! Um, and it meant Sally could not go back to work after a, a maternity leave and and stay at home and do the hardest job in the family and look after the kids. And it, it was just the right thing to do at the right time. I was I was gutted to leave Vodafone. Um, it still holds a, a, a dear place. In my heart, and I feel like I, I owe them a lot, but it, it was it was right for the family. And I had a year as head of quality and compliance, then left to um, to be the head of sales in retail in in Sky, and then I left there after two and a half years. I was at Sky and left and went to Stansted Airport as head of commercial. Okay, which. Uh, Bit, bit, bit of a change so going from yeah communications industry broadcast industry but um and the and, they, was, and did they say what do you what do you know about airplanes and you yeah, said well not, not a lot but i know a lot about ships correct correct <laughs> yeah well when i joined the navy they, the, the first question they asked me when i walked through the door so i wanted to join the navy is can you swim 
Uh, uh, I said, well, haven't you got any ships left? <laughs> <laughs> and, of course they had, and, and I did pass the naval, swimming, the naval swimming test, uh, but I'm not a strong swimmer. I'm not a strong swimmer. But, yeah, I, I knew nothing about the aviation industry, but my job there, head of commercial, I was looking after everything landside, so, so things like car parking and taxis, uh, all the ancillary income at the airport. It's quite an involved job. Um, and, and Stansted was a growing airport. At the time, it was moving 25 million passengers a year. They've got an ambition to grow that to, to 39 million. And they've got planning permission to, to do so. And it, it was quite an exciting time. And over the first two years, we were moving 29 million passengers, 100,000 passengers a day. Then, of course, February 2020, COVID hit. Mm. And almost overnight, we went from this hundred thousand passengers to twelve, and not not twelve thousand, twelve passengers. There was literally three sheep and a shepherd at the airport. <laughs> and of course, everyone was furloughed. Wonderful time. It was some of the best six months of of, of my life. Uh, being at home with the family, really enjoyed it. The weather was fantastic, and it gave me a lot of time to reflect. And when I was made redundant. In September 2020, I've got a good idea of, of, of the direction of travel that, that I want, wanted to, to pursue uh, and go out on a limb. And, and it was over that time that the the sort of the seed was sown for karma, as it were, because during that six months time, I'd got together with some old Royal Navy Rugby League teammates. Um, we played rugby league for the Navy, a great set of lads. And, and tragically, 12 years ago, we lost a teammate to suicide on his resettlement journey, a guy uh -huh. called Nigel Burkett. And that really, really affected me personally. I went up to the funeral, a lot of us did. Um, but above and beyond that, we'd not done anything to sort of mark that Nigel's passing. And um, it, it'd been nagging at me. So, so th during furlough, we got together and we formed a uh, it's a charitable organisation called In Touch Royal Navy Rugby League. And mm. In Touch is built on three pillars, reset, reconnect, and relive. Reset's all about helping people through that transition from service life to civilian life. Yeah. Reconnect, reaching out and talking to your old teammates, making sure they're all right, finding out what they're up to. And relive, getting together once or twice a year, having a few beers and a, and a meal. And remembering how good or bad you were 25 years ago, <laughs> and, and that's been a real success. We, you know, we we've, we've raised a lot of money for the charity. Very fortunate to be able to have helped a few people out um, when they've come into difficulty over the last couple of years. And um, the reason I'm telling you that one of the people I've reconnected with is Dr. Andrew Steele, Andy Steele as he was when I knew him, when he left the Navy 18 years ago. I knew that he'd moved out to Bangkok. And he started the Plant a Tree Today Foundation. And I'm like, I'm talking to him. He got a blurred background, a bit like you have now, Kevin. And uh, I'm like, so are you in, still in Bangkok? And he said, no, no, I've, I've moved. He said, I've moved from Bangkok back to Hull. I'm like, Andy, <laughs> let me stop you there, mate. No one moves from Bangkok to Hull. I said, yeah. <laughs> they only invented Hull to make Barnsley look like Las Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> you, you've just, you know, you've just alienated, you just you've just alienated half our audience before talking about Barnes. Now you've alienated the other half. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, the two wonderful places full of wonderful people. It's just, yeah, <laughs> it's just not quite West Berkshire, is it? But <laughs> when it comes to opportunity, I mean, let's face it, the, the, the evening up that's going on. It, there's a lot more opportunity in the south than, than there is in the north, especially in the engineering disciplines that, that, that Andy and I were in. And I said, so what? what you, tell me more about what you're doing. He said, well, don't worry, I'm still planting trees. And I'll never forget he, he said this. He said, Jim, he said, you won't realise this. He said, but said, I'm working with the Armed Forces Resettlement. He said, there's a big issue. People leaving the Armed Forces and not getting employment straight away. He yeah. said, and of the, of, of the people that do get employment within two years, 15% need a hand up, not an hand out, a hand up. And I said, well, why do you think I, I, I wouldn't know that? I said, I really struggled. He went, did you really? I went, yeah, I really did. He said, well, what, what we've done, he said, I formed a company that sits within Plant Tree Today Foundation called the Green Task Force. 
and what the Green Task Force does provides positive pathways for veterans and service leavers through nature-based tasks. And we do things such as canal clearing, planting trees, fencing, clearing woodlands. He said, and, and everyone in, in the Green Task Force gets a vocational qualification in horticulture at very least. He said, some of the guys and girls have got PTSD and we treat them through nature-based therapy. And then we work with recruitment companies to get them back on the employment ladder once they've got a story to tell and an emotional and a physical backstop. And it was at that point, I just sat here in this very chair and uh, I said, mate, how do I get involved? Mm. And he laughed because he was there when I got injured. He said, well, you are planting trees lofty. So I was there when you got injured. <laughs> well, I, said, I said, you're right, I won't be planting trees. But what I could do is come up with a product or a service that can get you thousands of trees to plant. And he went, well, go for it. And um, that, that, that's, that, that was the, the very first conversation when I felt there's something in this. So helping veterans out, helping the environment out, at the time was right with, with COVID, everyone had got a real appreciation for the green spaces and the outdoors. And, and I just thought, right, let, let, let me see if I can get a product to market. Let's see if there's any appetite for it and, and, and go for it. So I did. Great. And is, is Andy your co-founder? No, Andy's not. So Andy is still very much the, uh, he, he's a, the founder of the Plant a Tree Today Foundation and, and the Green Task Force. My co-founder is a guy called Ian Gurney. He comes along in the story. So, so we started with a domain called rewards.earth. We tested the market, was blown away by the response. Got people like CBRE, Yodel, Starbucks, just wanting to come and plant trees with us and, and do some wonderful things. Forces Cars Direct. And it, it was going really, really well. And then the guy I, I initially started the business with wanted to be an overnight millionaire. Hmm. And uh, that was never good, ne never my intention. This is a, we're playing the long game here. And, and we parted a company quite early on, very amicably. Um, and then I, I, I got introduced to Ian through a, a lead generation company, somebody who wanted to look at collaborating. I'm like, oh, here we go. And uh, mm -hmm. I spoke to him, the first time I spoke to him, he told me all about his idea for a business called Karma, which is short for Carbon Karma. And right. I thought, I really like that. I really, it's got a nice ring to it. Okay. And uh, I listened to his idea about getting lots and lots of people um, involved. And if everyone does a little bit, the impact is huge. Mm -hmm. And that was the idea, working in the consumer space. I'm thinking, well, I'm B2B and B2B2C. I really like this consumer offering. And after about three or four conversations, we realized, one, that we got on, and two, that the businesses worked very well together. So we, we decided to, to put them together, trade under the name Karma. I really liked Ian's branding. Mm -hmm. And we just went for it. Um, we had a, a, a very brief conversation down in King's Cross. He, he lives up in Cheshire. He got the train down and shook hands, and yeah, the, the rest hopefully is going to be history. Okay, and and so when when was that? So we put the companies together and the first of April last year. Right, just had your first first birthday, as it were. How's it how's it gone? What um what sort of stage have you got to? Well, last year was all about getting a, a minimal marketing product together um, and really testing the concepts in terms of tree planting days, hitting the numbers. Um, testing the market, understanding what our technical roadmap needed to look like, setting some milestones, hitting the milestones, and then we decided late September, early October that we were going to raise. Do do a raise. We were going to we were going to sell okay. ten percent of the business because initially we were going to bootstrap everything, but yep. the appetite was such, and our progress wasn't keeping up with demand in terms of the technical stack. So we decided to do a race to grow the team. Right. Um, and to to exacerbate some of the problems we got with, with tech and throw some money at it and get the tech over the line. So we made that decision in October. We went on this brilliant, I'm part of a group called Startup to Stand Up. And, and through that, I met the founder of a company called Founder Catalyst, a guy called Sam Simpson, who um, took us under his wing, taught, uh, I'd already, got SEIS and EIS approval. All right. Um, took, took, took me under his wing. Great guy, Sam. Turns out, uh, anywhere he, he could live in the UK, he lives next door to my wife's auntie in Newbury. 
Uh, I thought you were going to say Barnsley for a minute. No, 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 no. <laughs> uh, oh, hell. No, no, the world would have been too small to stand that. But um, great guy, Sam. And we got on his platform. We started talking to investors. And call it good luck, or fortune, what you will. But the, probably the, the third conversation. Well, we went as part of our Hero Preneurs mentoring programme. Um, we we which I'm part of went went to Goldman Sachs with our pitch deck, pitched in front of a, a team of probably the smartest people I've ever been free in front of in my entire life, who gave yeah. some real fit, great feedback, some amazing feedback. And then all of a sudden we were sat down with a couple of investors, we tweaked our pitch. I mean, Sam said it was a great pitch deck anyway, but the the nuggets we got from Goldman Sachs, and we sat down with this investor and. Our idea was to get four four angels right. uh, coming for two and a half percent each. We sat down with this guy and it, we were just in Cheshire. And he, he just sat down and he said, I'm gonna I could have the two and a half percent's not enough for me. I'll give you the money for ten percent. And we shook hands. Great. And and what did what did you learn about that process? Because that that from what how you described your journey, I would imagine that's the first time you've done anything like that in terms of raising raising money. Absolutely. So, so a little bit like being head of commercial at Stan Steady, you have to be all over your numbers. That's not a macro level. That's a, yeah, if someone wants to dig into a number, you, you've got to be able to quickly pull out of a hat where that number's come from and, and back it up yeah. and, and really be on your front foot with that. It's one of the things that, that picked up from Goldman Sachs. Okay. Be all over your numbers and, and it's great to have pretty pictures, but back it up with some solid hard hitting statements. The, um, the market is ripe for karma in terms of removal of CO2, in terms of social impact, environmental in, impact, net biodiversity gain, we, we, all the things we do. So all those signals were really strong, but numbers, you've got other numbers, right? If you're sitting down with an investor who's going to give you his hard earned cash, and it doesn't matter how wealthy they are, they're, they're not going to part with the types of sums of money without doing the due diligence, without doing the homework. And more importantly, the feedback that we got is people believed in us as individuals and the way that we work together. Give you a little bit of background on Ian. This, this as he would jokingly say, this isn't his first rodeo. Mm -hmm. It's his fifth startup. He, he exited his last one, very, a very successful exit a couple of years ago. Right. And um, he, he, he's, he's done really well. Um, so he knows that, and this is what's one of the fundamental reasons why we raised in the first place, because we had a frank discussion on where we wanted to be in five years' time. And it's not selling the business. I love it so much. I, I would go out planting trees with veterans every day of the week if I could, because it's so. It's just it's great for the body, great for the soul and, and, and your mental health and so rewarding. Um, so we, we want to still be majority shareholders in five years time, but we do want other people to come along and invest and, and take money off the table as we go yeah. through that journey. And when we were both really candid about that. Okay. Both got shared vision. We want to plant millions of trees in the UK and abroad. But at the same time, we, we want to be able to provide for, for the family and let other people join in the party and build the platform into a global brand. And he said, well, to do that, we, we need to precede investment, we, which forced out the decision. And it's just, yeah, it worked out really well. It, it was a record time raise um, on Founder Catalyst. We'd done it all dusted, banked within six weeks. Wow. And it really gave us the opportunity to to start scaling up and we didn't want to be a revenue led business. We wanted to be a growth led business. And it just meant that we could, we could bring some of our plans forward in terms of the tech we need to, to get to the next level. And what were some of the things that, that you learned from the Goldman Sachs panel then? What were, what were some of the nuggets? Credibility. Okay. So, so a really smart guy. He said, so, so we, Loving what you're saying, I, I don't doubt you're doing what you're doing. So, but where's the real credibility here? He said, have you have you got any way of? Um, are you being audited? Are you doing the B Corp certification? So, which which really frank what you're doing, and we we that really hit home that we got to do something in that space, which we, we've now addressed 
we're just going through our final stages of B, B Corp auditing. Um, yeah. Wow, that's been a slog. That's been a real slog. Mm. And, and but but fundamentally, you, you've got the building blocks of a of a great organisation. Everything in there from the way that you, you treat your people, your customers, sat, the customer satisfaction, your suppliers, um, your articles of association. We've had to really build it bottom up. And then demonstrate that we're doing it. All our diaries are, are, are filled, and we have we have some great, great meetings on, on all, all the stuff. It, well, it's really it's, it's governance, it's corporate governance, and it's just giving us the right framework to build the company out. So it's, it, yeah, it's gone really well. Great. So that that was as, uh, that. Do you know what? I'll be straight um, until until that meeting at Golden Sachs. I knew how much work was involved in the B Corp, and I was. I'm going to say a little bit arrogant because we were do, we're doing so much good. I'm saying, do we really need to get the B Corp accreditation? Because look, we're putting trees in the ground. We can prove it mm. uh, empirically that we're doing it. But when he said it, I thought, do you know what? If I'd got the B Corp stamp on this deck now, he wouldn't have even asked that question because that, that that's that's franked. So yeah, that that was a big takeaway from the Goldman Sachs meeting. I went to him right. I'm gonna I'm gonna give you that one. We need to be B Corp accredited. I'll leave it to you. Let me know when it's done. <laughs> but, but this is Ian's a programmer. He loves lists and he loves having a list. He's happy when he's got a to-do list as long as you're arm and he's working his way through it because he's in control. You show me a list and I'm and my head's all over the place. Yeah. So it courses for courses and I've got to say though he's not enjoyed this, but but he's put some real effort into it. Yeah, it's he's doing a great job. Him and Emily. Yeah, it's um it's a very worthwhile thing too. We've had a couple of a couple of our scale up radio guests that have that have been through it, and it um it's it's pretty lengthy, isn't it? My from my my understanding, I've not been through it myself, but it's you know eighteen months, two two years. Some people are talking about it taking to go through. Yeah, yeah, um, um, we, we're um, we, we're getting we're scoring really highly. Because we're small and we're, we're building out in the right way, um, some of the stuff that, that we do, um, you know, the volunteer work, being part of charities, we're both part of charities. Mm. And, uh, yeah, we, we, we're coming out with a real, real high score and we're being audited um, to, to the nth degree as a result of that because they don't give these things away uh, easily. Yeah. But then when you're claiming to do so much stuff above and beyond what is the norm, which we are, Mm. And they really want to know about in the difference it's making, the impact to the veterans. And uh, just seeing some of the the, the, the surveys that, that are coming back from the veteran community in the Green Task Force over the last couple of weeks, it's brilliant to see because you can see that what we're doing is having a direct impact on them and their, their mental health. It's just brilliant, really rewarding stuff. Brilliant. So, so how do you make a business model out of out of planting the trees that somebody's prepared to invest a, a, a chunk of money in? What's what's the what's the vision that they've bought into? We make social and environmental impact easy and affordable. And, and what does that actually mean? You know, if you're if you're, if you're coming coming to me and you're asking me to to, to buy into your services, what does what does that actually mean for me? It means that you can very easily have some really tangible to tell your internal and external customers whether that's employees shareholders potential shareholders or investors when people ask you what you're really doing we can very quickly and easily work with you to do something that's tangible everyone always says how do we know these trees are planted i'm like well i could walk you to them we and and people like go cardless who planted five thousand trees with us uh, last year, Ben Knight, who's their head of sustainability, said it's the best day he's ever had. A day out in a five-acre field in East Yorkshire, planting 15 different species of trees. Well, I mean, and and he's got a dashboard that he can share with all, all his customers, internal and external, really showing the impact, how many trees have been planted, how much CO2 will be absorbed over time. So it's empirical, you know, as a tree grows, it absorbs CO2. How many work days that's created? And they just came and had the best day with us on, on the East Coast. And, and that's what we're selling. We're selling the solution because, you see, I talk to so many people who, who, <laughs> who have done nothing, they're doing nothing, and they've got nothing planned. What, what are you doing in the ESG space? Well, 
in, especially in the, the CO2 removal space. Oh, well, th this next couple of years for us, it's all about measuring. Then we're, then we're going to reduce. Then we're going to offset what's left. And like, so what are you doing now? Well, we're measuring. So but, but you're not doing anything. Come and have a day with us. Come out, plant some trees, put them in the ground, see what impact you can have on the environment and your own mental health and your team from a team building perspective. It is so, so rewarding. And yeah, I'm not going to mention which company it was, but it, a particular company, the entire board came out and, and the, uh, the CEO, as it were, said to me, about two hours in, she said, look at these people. They never normally talk to each other, <laughs> but they're all working together. And the, the barriers have dropped because they've got a common purpose. And it was really good. It consolidated them as a as a leadership team. Yeah. So you're breaking the barriers down just, just, just through doing nature-based tasks. Great. And, is, and from a from a revenue generating perspective, is is this if I'm the company, is this a is this a one off or is this a subscription or a recurring revenue stream for you? How does how does that side work? So, so our, we, our product offering is threefold. So you've got the corporate tree planting days, yep. which hopefully people some companies come twice a year. Some will come, come um, once a year. You then got what we call tree commerce. OK. And the way three commerce is worth and an hour, this is where Ian came in. He said, look, I want every transaction today to have a positive reaction for the future. So every time you, for example, every time you did a podcast, you could plant a tree in the UK, employing a veteran or service leader, cost five pounds. Right. You could do that if you're selling a car, if you're selling an insurance. Okay. And, 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 and it, you're just rewarding people, planet, and your customer. As a, and it, you make you stand out in the marketplace. And and an onshore tree is five pounds. An offshore tree, social economic explain into it, is 20, 25p. So there's companies that every single product they sell, they plant a tree, some plant five, and they've got an impact dashboard where they can demonstrate to their customers the impact they're having just through selling the product. And it's it's low cost, high impact stuff. We've, yeah. got, we've got a taxi company 24-7. They've planted 60,000 trees already, and they just love it. Wow. They absolutely, absolutely love it, getting involved, in, and it's it's tangible. It's real, and it's empirical. When you plant a tree, three things happen. One, the social mobility. You're employing someone to put a tree in the ground. Mm -hmm. you know, and that, that means they can send the kids to school. It means I can put food on the table. It's great for the mental health. Then the tree goes in the ground. You get net biodiversity gain. The species that will live up on that tree in that forest that you're planting. And then, of course, over time, <clears throat> the tree will grow and absorb CO2 from the atmosphere. Yeah. So there's just three empirical, wonderful things that happen as a direct result of people funding trees to be planted brilliant so i, I mean you yeah, i can i can tell by obviously the passion coming coming through that you you, you love this I mean, what it, what is it if you put it into words what is it you love about what you what you're doing it's doing good i just yeah. just love I, I love that he's building a legacy it's making a difference in the world and, and it's giving something back to people and planet i feel like the first my you know my first career was in service to the country mm -hmm. um, then i had a little bit of a rough patch resettlement but then then i joined the corporate world and i made people literally millions and millions of pounds through the decisions i made and, and the expertise i brought to the workplace this, yeah. this, what I'm going to call my final chapter. I'm hoping it's going to be a long one, though, Kevin. Yeah, yeah. And my dad's 17. He comes out tree planting with us. So, so I still want to be planting trees when I'm 70. I'm hoping dad's still still, still with yeah. us yeah. in 20 years' time, and he's there as well. But um, I, that, I want this to be my legacy. He's, he, he's get, getting a load, load of trees in the ground, helping as many people out as we can and making a big difference. And we're building the, the tech to, to enable Karma to be really scalable. People plug in. And like I said, we've got 
corporate tree planting days. We've got the tree commerce, which is wonderful. We've got subscriptions where for as little as three ninety nine a month, you can join the Karma, Karma Club and be a chameleon. A and chameleon, then, okay. Come on, come on, come on, chameleon. Yeah, okay. <laughs> don't, don't get me singing, Kevin. You don't want to hear that. Um, but for three ninety nine, and, and and it's all about lots of people doing a little bit and making a difference. We we built a shop. We've got three and a half thousand brands on there, and if you 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 book your airport parking through there, you get a cash back and trees planted. So you're saving money on the planet. Right. And we we we're just getting our in, we're positioning ourselves to really grab the market and, and make a difference. We're all about impact. And you you, you speak to people in, in corporates who make, who make me laugh with the, you know, the, the director of impact. <laughs> yeah. this, this, is what, this is what we built Karma for. Let's go. Get involved. <laughs> for, the, for the directors of impact yeah brilliant okay so let's have a couple of minutes on on the on the military you know what if what if, what do you think um you bring from the from the military what what is so great about um being being a, a veteran a bit what and what are you what are you what have you brought and lessons you've learned from uh from serving your country if you like and working in the military the first thing that happens when, when you join the the military is that they take you to pieces yeah they literally take you down to, to a base level and build you up in a way that really helps you helps you you, the, you condition to within an inch of your life you train to within an inch of your life so that you, you're very reactive you, you uh, but at the same time adaptable you, you you're malleable in terms of you can you can learn new skills but fundamentally it's all about mental discipline and and being being up for it so one of the things that, that my wife can't get over is that if i decide to do something if i commit it's done mm. and, and an example um 514 days ago i said i weren't gonna have another drink <laughs> and, I haven't, and i haven't touched a drop of alcohol i just said i'm just gonna i'm gonna stop for a while much to sammy's um uh, this May, I, I forgot to cancel my Lathwaite subscription. So I've got 78 bottles of wonderful wine in, in the room next door. But but I just said, you know, I'm, I'm, and it's indefinitely, I will have another drink. I didn't have a problem, but, but it's the same. It's that mental discipline that, that's instilled into you in the forces. Yeah. Uh, and, and then the sense of belonging to something, the, the camaraderie, the friendships that you build, how to deal with people. Um, yeah, have it, the, the emotional intelligence that, that you're taught living in such a um, close quarters with so many varied in, individuals and then having the opportunity to travel around the world, then realising how fortunate you are mm. to be from the UK and, and the, the, the privilege that, that comes as a part of that sanitation, education. What did the Romans do for us? But <laughs> and uh, yeah, the, the penny. I was very fortunate. The penny dropped when I when I was really young, and I really started applying myself. You know, I I, I, I was I left like I said, I left Barnsley with three GCSEs, and I thought I'd beaten the teachers, and, and <laughs> I'd really stolen March because I was more than capable of doing a lot better. Yeah. which I subsequently proved. If, if, I'd have, if I'd have applied myself at school like I applied myself in the military, yeah. um, I'd have got a lot further, a lot faster in, in the forces. But I, I joined as a um, a rating. I finished as a non-commissioned officer with, with a degree. I took myself to college, and it, it taught me all about commitment and application, really, mm. and that, that mental discipline to, to, to see things through. And, and and why do you think um, I absolutely agree? And why do you think um, it is so difficult? Because it is for people through, through that resettlement process. It is it is a tough adjustment to make, isn't it? When you come out of the military into back to Civvy Street, you know what what? Why is that so hard? And and perhaps why why are we why are people in business not going great? Somebody from the military, let's have let's get them straight on board in our in my company. You know why 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 is that that not happening? Um, I always say 
I mean, when you when you leave your for, the forces, like I said, you, you lose those three things overnight. Your purpose, your identity, and your force of family. Mm. You're in an environment where you're set up to succeed yeah. in the forces. It's in everyone's best interest if you're in the armed forces, if you're winning, right? Yeah. Because if you're not winning, the country's losing. <laughs> yeah. So so you train to do everything to within an inch of your life. You've got clear structure. So from the minute you get up in the morning, you're fed, you've got the right uniform. You know, it's, it's up to you whether you're eyeing it or not. <laughs> However, you train to within an inch of your life. So all the, 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 the equipment you work on, you've been on all the courses, you've been taught by experts, you know what to do when things go wrong. You know how to react, to respond, to call it, call it what you, you will, uh, in, a, in a chips down environment. All those skills are transferable. You, you've proved, that, mm. really proved that, that you're up for it and that you can commit. And I always say, you know, veterans, they've got an amazing skill set because they, they know in the face of adversity what to do. I always yeah. said veterans are valuable, not vulnerable. Right. And I, and I think that's a, a real clear message. And I'm working with some companies such as Ben Reed at Redeployable, who just really matching veteran skill set into into civilian street jobs because you know there's a lot of expertise out there and a lot a lot of people who um like you say i mean the, my, our first hire well, when we got the investment our first hire was a veteran and he's just brilliant he really applies himself to everything and 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 there's a little bit of a competitive element in there as well because he's army i'm navy it was great to be to be the army at Twickenham in the rugby game this year. Yeah. Um, it, was, it was a bit of a laugh about, I had a laugh about that on the, on the Monday morning, but, but yeah, Kev, Kev's a fantastic hire, just real good attitude. Nothing phases him. He gets frustrated when people can't understand why everyone's standards aren't as high as what ours are. And that's yeah. personal and professional standards. That's the other thing that you, you, that you take from the, the armed forces is just having, having high standards. And then, Wondering why peoples are less so. Yeah, and, and like you say, you know, just the simple things. If, if if you commit to something, then you commit to something, and it'll 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 get done. And and that is less common, isn't it, outside of the forces? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. When when we say we're going to do something, we do it, and it, it's really, it's it's you know, my friends and we say, oh yeah, are we going out? Yeah. I mean, I'm meeting a guy who's veteran tonight. I've not spoken to him for two weeks, but I'll be picking him up at seven o'clock for a curry. And he'll right. just expect me because we've committed. Yeah. <laughs> it's not yeah. like bringing him up three three times in the way. Are you still on? You're just like, yeah. no, we said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you've got 78 bottles of wine for the next time you have one of your relive sessions, haven't you? <laughs> yeah, absolutely, yeah. Well, well, I've done two now. Um, Stone Cold Sober, which has been um, it's been quite interesting because I I was the MC at both of them. Yeah, right. So, so I had to, and, and I had the the privilege, the honour of introducing Bobby Davro at the one in March. <laughs> it was a blast from the past. Excellent. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. All right. Good. Well, what about you mentioned legacy? So a, 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 a billion trees, did you say? Is that what's the what what's the legacy you want to leave? To have made as much social and environmental impact as humanly yeah. possible and leave a company that that is still playing you know, the platform is it's an aggregation platform people plug into the platform and they, they trade through it they subscribe to it uh, and it just automatically does good for people and planet that's the legacy we want karma to, to be a so a, a household name that's associated as a force for good brilliant fantastic so you're up for a couple of quick fire questions yes so if you could go back to your younger self maybe when you were at barnsley or maybe not that young but if you go back to your younger self what would your advice be i would say it'd be pay more attention at school really apply yourself at school i, I the problem i've got is the, my, my hormones went haywire between the the ages of 14 to to 38 <laughs> <laughs> which which was a which was a major distraction i was just interested in girls and booze um at, at, 
all those all those ages didn't really calm down until I was 38 but I just couldn't apply myself at school and and yeah I, I wasted my education but I, I, I quickly cottoned on that the, the thing that made me stand stand out in the Royal Navy was my my mental ability to do well and retain information and regurgitate and, and pass tests if only I, I and I didn't associate doing well in exams in, in doing well in your career yeah uh, earning money but it, it was really apparent really quickly that you know the, the better you did in your exams in the navy the quicker you got promoted i was a leading hand same as a corporal in the army by the time i was 19 i was one of the youngest mm. in, in the royal navy and, and i progressed through the ranks really quickly so so that's what i do pay more attention at school brilliant all right what about books or podcasts any particular resources that you would highlight for <clears throat> others i'm a massive stephen colby fan okay so the seven habits of highly effective people I, I've, yeah. I've got a copy i quickly glanced over to it then it's dog-eared he's got loads of he's got loads of um he's got loads of post-it notes in it on relevant pages it's the kind of book you can pick up and, and be constantly delighted with it yeah. and there's some great lessons in there the yeah. books i mean yeah fiction books i was a massive tolkien and um, terry pratchett fan yeah yeah excellent very good okay good good books there any apps or bits of technology i mean obviously there's your own your own platform but uh, any any apps or bits of technology that you find particularly useful i love slack space which, <laughs> Back which we which we switched off before we started the call, but yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. Uh, technology and me. The older I get, the worse I get. It. But I love Headspace. Okay. So, so yeah. mindfulness. I'm fortunate when I was at Sky. Um, to do a to do a better self course, which included meditation. Sky really invested in his people. Wonderful company to work for, and. Um, now that's, that was the start of my meditation journey. Then I picked it up again a couple of years ago and used Headspace. Just just a great way to to decompress yeah. and, and connect mind and body. Be present. Excellent. So, good, good. So Headspace. And who's who's who would you say has had the most influence on you as a as a leader? The first time I got promoted, um, I was on the way back from the first Gulf War. Uh, on HMS Manchester and I was very young and I remember marching to the captain's table and the captain said you're very very young to be promoted to, to this rank he said but there are some great examples of leadership on the sh ship good and bad <laughs> and he said my advice to you being a young man is to emulate the good ones but learn <laughs> but learn the most from the bad ones oh interesting and, and that was that was and, and i took that through through my life and just thinking yeah that's good and thinking i would never be like that or if i am like that please call it out and stop me yeah and then uh, yeah but that that was amazing advice and i've been very fortunate to work for some wonderful people um like I said, I, the the guy I worked for at Sky, Keith Martin, he was inspirational. A real, you know, learned so much from, from him. It was a pleasure to work for him for a couple of years. Yeah, fantastic, good. From a marketing perspective, what's your most successful way of generating new customers? Referrals, without a shadow of a doubt. Um, we yeah. we've switched the marketing on to the website. The, 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 we've got paid search working for us now which it, it can be hit and miss but the, the marketing qualified leads but, but, but word of mouth referrals using LinkedIn do lots of videos on there that the people get they get a lot of traction people asking how they can get involved um, and so that's worked really well from uh, for us but lead generation is a tricky one mm. it's, it, it's tricky that the market becomes more congested daily as far as I'm aware, we're the only company in the UK that employing veterans and service leavers. Yeah. So uh, that really stands us apart. Yeah, I think that's a really nice, really nice uh, aspect to it. Fantastic. It's been a delight to talk to you, Jim. Really, really enjoyed your company So and, and your advice. So thank you for that. If people would like to get hold of you or find out more about 
karma what's the what's the best way for them to do that um either email me jim.holland at karma.earth connect to me on linkedin send me a message but always available for a chat a cup of coffee and, and hopefully a bit of fun yeah. if, it, if it's if it's not fun it's work and i might as well be back in barnsley down the pit <laughs> brilliant well, on that note thank you very much indeed for joining today on skeleton radio jim thank you kevin it's been an absolute pleasure <laughs> i almost believe you <laughs> i almost believe myself <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that discussion. And if you're building and scaling your own business, you might well be interested in our book, The Entrepreneurial Scale-Up System. And it's exactly what it says on the tin. It's a practical handbook around scaling a business in a structured way. And you can order a copy on all your favorite online retailers, including an audio version, or you can find it and other supporting resources on our website, www.esusgroup.co.uk. That's esusgroup.co.uk, which is E-S-U-S-G-R-O-U-P.co.uk. This has been a Monkey Pants Productions podcast.